So we've gone over and compared prophecy, Old Testament, New Testament, and find out that the same rules apply. Take a look at this chart. Prophecy in Moses' writings in Hebrew and Church Age writings in Greek compared relative to prophecy. Moses and ancient Israel. Daniel, 483 years to our Lord's crucifixion, plus the seven-year tribulation period. Verified so far. Dan, Daniel survives the lion's den. Fiery furnace survival. Dreams interpreted correctly. Fulfilled prophecies. That's Daniel 9, 24 to 27. <coughs> Uh, Matthew Gospel, yet future. Israel is in view. Jesus as the one giving it. Tribulation period, including second coming and judgment of the nations. Many, many miracles to authenticate that, especially healing and feeding of multitudes. Matthew 24 and 25. You have John, Luke, Gospels of Israel in view. John the Baptist, Lamb of God, takes away sins of the world. He's on board. Did he not die for the sins of the whole world? We're baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's the Nazarite vows of John. John 129-34 and Luke 3, 16-17. We have the church age now. <coughs> Paul, tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge will cease. And they did, actually, authenticated. Uh, ceased to be authenticated from the first century on. That's all faked. Miraculous healing tongues and so on. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, which we're looking at now. Church age, Paul. The rapture of the church, the Holy Spirit's restraining influence removed. Miracles, healing, tongues, and, and so on. Authenticate that. First Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Second Thessalonians 2. Church age, Jesus. Church age, Holy Spirit, baptism. Many, many miracles, especially healing, feeding multitudes. John 14, 16 to 17, and 15, 26. And we have the church age where Jesus, the rapture of church age believers, very close. Many, many miracles, especially healing, feeding of multitudes. So authenticates that his foretelling his prophecy of the rapture of church age believers is something that's to be questioned as, as true, not questioned. John 14, 1 to 4. Now we have the gift of word of knowledge. With respect to knowledge and word of knowledge, in the same way that ecclesia refers to a general gathering, but was also coined in, into the technical term that in context refers to the body of Christ, the church. So knowledge is a general term as it appears in Proverbs 8 and Isaiah 11, having no special miraculous qualities to it with respect to being new revelation directly from God. But it has been coined by church age apostle and writer Paul into a technical term within the context, of course, that it has to be referring to the spiritual gift of word of knowledge with special supernatural qualities and new and special revelation from God, often via visions and dreams, which follows the rules. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 7 to 8. There are different gifts, different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given to the, for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. Notice that God the Holy Spirit provides the message of knowledge to the believer. Evidently such knowledge must be of special revelatory and unique nature in order for it to qualify for being a communication as a result of the spiritual gift of word of knowledge. Otherwise, the information would simply fall under the realm of being no more unique than which that which is, has already been communicated in the existing Bible. So, if that's the case, open up the Bible and read it. Don't pro pro profess or, or act as if you've got something new. This is uh, not the way God works. I think you will find the clue, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, for understanding what the gift of knowledge is in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, where he, Paul, connects knowledge with knowing all mysteries. In other words, the gift of knowledge is the God-given ability to understand the mysteries of God. In the Greek Bible of the Church Age, the term mystery is defined as something totally unrevealed in the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible and revealed for the first time, in this case, in the 27 books of the Church Age writings of Scripture. So if it wasn't in the Hebrew Bible yet, in the the New Testament had been written yet, this would be a word of knowledge, something new. This is a God-given ability to understand comprehensively the church age truth and how it fits within the larger progressive revelation of God throughout the scriptures. It should be a corollary, it would be a corollary gift to go along with the gift of teaching or prophecy for that matter. While one could have the gift of knowledge without the gift of teaching, one could not have the gift of teaching without the gift of knowledge because you have to be able to know it to communicate it. This church age gift 
parallels the provision of special revelatory knowledge and wisdom in Daniel 1, 17 to 20, both gifts apparently being in view in this passage. From God to prophets Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the Hebrew Bible period when these Israelites were provided special knowledge and wisdom supernaturally. Take a look at Daniel 1, 17 to 20. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom, because it bore up to be true. So the spiritual gift of word of knowledge must be a unique revelatory character. Otherwise, all biblical knowledge would have to be a spiritual gift assigned to all believers, but not all have the same gifts. If knowledge in general qualified as a spiritual gift of word of knowledge, then it would have little unique value since all believers would have such a gift. Furthermore, Paul indicates that not all receive this gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Further details on how this gift differs from the similar spiritual gifts of wisdom and prophecy are not available from the Bible. So we move on. 1 Corinthians 13, 8-9. And here's the crux of the matter. Love never fails. But where there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. See, it's only temporary. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Only temporary. Where there's knowledge, it will be done away with. Only temporary, see? But we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We only know part of the story. And he goes, where there are tongues. Okay, let's go back into the church age spiritual gift of tongues to find. This becomes a problem for people who want to hang on to this gift when it's not for today. No new revelation for today. The purpose of the church age spiritual gifts of tongues. Paul defines the purpose and hence the ceasing point for this category of gifts in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. And the law is written, Through men of strange tongues, and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, Israel. That's Israel, Isaiah 28. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Paul goes on to say, about after quoting this passage from Isaiah 28, as he defines the purpose of tongues, therefore tongues, notice tongues, plural, signifying the entire category of the gifts of tongues, multiple languages. They are then are assigned not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. We have distinguishing factor. Take a look at Isaiah 28, 11. A sign, a warning to unbelieving Jews of temple judgment is quoted in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, 21. Temple judgment by the Assyrians coming in. God is announcing to Jews and through Isaiah the prophet, you're going to get something that's going to come at you, and you know this is from God and his impending judgment if you don't turn around because Assyria is going to come in with this known language of the Assyrian guttural language, which is not as harmonious as Hebrew, and they're going to be taking over your country and dispersing you. Verse 21 is a quotation from Isaiah 28, 11, God's message of warning and judgment upon Israel, hundreds of years before Paul became an apostle. At that time, God pled with the nation Israel, and each time she rebelled, he sent ever-increasing judgment, drought, famine, pestilence, and still the kingdom, Israel, northern kingdom, rebelled. Finally, Isaiah 28, 11 was God's final warning this time to the southern kingdom of Israel before suffering a final stage of judgment at the hand this time of the Assyrians. The message, in effect, was you are going to hear men speaking in foreign languages at your doorstep, indicating severe temporal judgment at the hands of a foreign power. As a matter of fact, our Lord himself predicted such a judgment in Luke chapter 21. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, AD 70 is in view, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. But this is the time of fulfillment, of punishment, and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against the, the, this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles, by the Romans in 870, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. When Titus sacked the city of Jerusalem and dispersed the Jews all over the world in 70 AD, the purpose for the gift of tongues was thus completely fulfilled. And so this gift immediately ceased 
in and of itself as the intransitive verb sante, uh, sante indicates in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, and his history as recorded. Notice that in the book of Acts, of the three instances of the gift of tongues being used, Jews were always present. So here's the historical background of Isaiah 20, 11. The death of his Syrian monarch Tiglath Pileser, 727 BC, raised false hopes of freedom for the little kingdoms on the Mediterranean seaboard. When King Ahaz, king of Judah, who aligned himself with Assyria for protection, dies about a year later, Isaiah uttered a prophecy warning Philistia of the consequences of revolt and by implication counseled Judah against joining her. Joining her. It was some time later that Hosea withheld tribute from Shalmaneser V, who for three years besieged the northern kingdom of Samaria, which was later taken by his successor Sargon. According to the Assyrians, over 27,000 Israelites were deported at this time, being settled in the northern parts of the Assyrian Empire. For about a decade, the area was fairly quiet, Sargon be being occupied with wars elsewhere. But then Egypt began to encourage the Philistines and others to form a new coalition against Assyria. This coalition was crushed by Sargon in 711 in the battle on the Egyptian border. Judah under Hezekiah stayed out of this, heeding Isaiah's warning. Sargon died around 705 BC, but was replaced by Sennacherib. Immediately there was trouble in different parts of the Assyrian Empire, encouraged by the Ethiopian monarchs, who were imparting new vigor to Egypt, and also Merodach Baladan, Badak Apaladina of Babylon. This time, despite Israel, Isaiah's warnings, as Hezekiah became involved and prepared Jerusalem for a siege, the Assyrian army invaded Judah, taking 46 walled cities and devastating much of the countryside. It invested surrounded for siege purposes Jerusalem, but Isaiah encouraged Hezekiah to trust the Lord, and the city was delivered. Miraculous deliverance that Assyrian army was destroyed. So Isaiah chapters 8 to 10 look forward to future, future Isaiah, Assyrian attacks, and chapters 11 to 12 predict return from exile. Both are future at the time of Isaiah writing it. Likewise, chapter 28 is looking forward, not backward. Isaiah mocks Isaiah's, Isaiah mocks Isaiah's God's message in Isaiah 28:10, and God marks back, mocks back in 28:11, predicting what will happen when He uses the Assyrians to judge His people. Isaiah ministered from about 740 to after 701 when Sennacherib attacked Jerusalem, and soon God destroyed His army. This was in the reign of Hezekiah. Isaiah wrote about events before they transpired. He looks back and says his predictions have now been fulfilled. So John Martin says in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, the message to Israel of destruction by foreign invaders was also for Judah. Though she would not be completely destroyed because Jerusalem would not be taken, Judah would face much suffering. So yeah, the 46 walled cities destroyed. The people of the southern kingdom had much the same attitude as their northern brothers. They, were, they too were scoffing at God's revelation through Isaiah. Dr. Fruchtenbaum says on this, the historical background from Isaiah 28 has to do with the crises of the 14th reign year of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah allowed himself to be talked into a, joining an alliance with Egypt and rebel against the Assyrian Empire to which Judah had been subjected under King Ahaz. Isaiah warned that such a rebellion against Assyria was contrary to God's will, and although Hezekiah normally listened to Isaiah. In this one case, he failed to do so. Isaiah states that because of this act of disobedience, the Assyrians will invade, and they will hear the Assyrian language outside their walls. When they hear the Assyrian language, it will be a sign of their unbelief of Isaiah's prophecy. There you go. So the strange tongues, okay, now all of a sudden, we go into the first century, and we have again, bringing up that prophecy, about the ancient kingdom and the Judah, kingdom of Judah, and they were surrounded by the Assyrian army. God rescued them because Hezekiah repented and the army of Assyria was destroyed. But now we, uh, Paul is bringing this forth before and said, this is going to happen again. Remember that Isaiah 28.10 and what happened to Judah then? What's going to happen, you think, now? They didn't pay any attention to it. Now we have AD 70. So no special revelation came through the Assyrian language on that occasion. The point is made by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 or 14. The point is that when they hear the Assyrian language in the land, they will serve to, to them as a sign of Judah's unbelief, 
Hence, temporal judgment would be at hand. Had Judah obeyed Isaiah the prophet, there would have been no Assyrian invasion 